Ben, how do you make sure that you don't burn out in this industry? Oh, well, that's a, that's a very good question. And actually, just recently, I, I mean, I have experienced some burnout in the last year. So there was, oh, just one, one more thing, one more thing, one more thing. We got everything resolved. We got everything signed out. And so there's that big sigh of, of relief that, yeah, we're over the hill. We can move on to the next thing. And then it's like, oh, I'm exhausted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and it's, yeah, it was very much like a wall. Uh, that you suddenly hit and then fall off of. And and it took me, I don't know, a couple of months, I think, to recognize it and then kind of get back and dust myself off. And I guess that's what being an entrepreneur is. I'm Julie B. And they don't teach this in business school. Hey there, I'm Julie B. And you're listening to They Don't Teach This in Business School, a podcast where we discuss business ownership lessons that are learned through experience, not in a classroom or seminar. Today's episode is really exciting because I get to interview Ben Johnson, the founder and CEO of Freya Systems. And I know we are going to just have a great conversation. Ben and I have some things in common, including the uh, Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program. So I know kind of the journey he's been on and just going through that program myself. And I know we're going to learn a lot of fun stuff. So Ben, welcome to the show. Thank you for the time and thank you for being here today. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited to have this conversation. I think it should be fun. Yeah, so let's just start it off with, tell us about Freya Systems, what you all do, who you serve, and you know what your job role is there. Okay, yeah, sure thing. So um, the, easiest, the easiest way to, to describe it is we, we help people predict the future or our customers kind of predict the future. Um, so we do that with a combination of uh, artificial intelligence, algorithms, and software. So very much, we, we serve the, the aviation and utilities industries. So we're helping them to, to re-engineer solutions to some of their, their problems, very much in that sort of predictive space. So for those not familiar with kind of predictive modeling, I'll give you a, a couple of sort of examples. One of the things we can do is we can write an algorithm that can take data off an aircraft and then predict when a part is gonna fail. What that does is that allows them to be proactive so they can either do maintenance in advance or they, they can at least um, predisposition a kind of part all the way through to uh, the different uh, area from, from aviation, which is wastewater treatment, we've done some, some great uh, algorithms there, which actually optimize their entire process. And uh, that's exciting area. It's a kind of newer area for us, but it's an exciting area because not only does it help them optimize the process they do, but it also reduces their overall energy consumption. So it feels like a win for us because we get to do uh, an exciting project, a win for them because they optimize, and then a win for the planet because we're, we're saving energy. So. Uh, that, that, that's probably a, a good sort of overview of what we do. Yeah, and AI is everywhere. I mean, it is everywhere. And it's not, the interesting conversations about AI is that it's not new. It's been around for a while. It's just, I think the rate of innovation and change is just speeding up. And so I would really, for, from somebody who is in this industry who has to stay on top of stuff, how do you create a team culture that can stay on top of it and, and actually stay ahead of it without kind of getting overwhelmed and burned out? Oh, that's, uh, that's a great question. And it's, uh, I'm a huge believer in the culture of the team. It's one of the things we invest a lot of time in. So we do, we do a combination of things like uh, curiosity is one of our core values. So we're, we're all a group of lifelong learners. So a lot of the team have like a package about a week's worth of time that they can focus just on learning kind of new uh, elements. And then they share that with the rest of the team on a, on a kind of, we have these monthly meetings where we, we share what we've learned with everyone as a result. So that helps them stay on top of what they're, they're doing. The culture is actually developed around a, this, this very collaborative sort of approach as well. So there's, there's a lot of people helping each other out and I'm a huge believer from a burnout standpoint, I'm a huge believer on that work-life balance. So wherever possible, we make sure our team is only working like a maximum of sort of 40 hours a week. Occasionally they'll, they'll do more. I mean, it's business and sometimes projects will drive it a different way, but that always allows them to come back refreshed and that then allows them to tackle problems so much easier. So it's a, it's a combination of kind of facilitating that ever-growing learning and you're right the, the that particular market is moving at such a high pace so uh, it, it just facilitating that that learning i think is is what achieves the best results 
And it's interesting you bring up burnout because that's something that I talk about a lot just in general as small business owners. And one element of that is definitely making sure your people don't burn out. But I'm curious, Ben, how do you make sure that you don't burn out in this industry? Oh, well, that's a, that's a very good question. And actually, just recently, I, I mean, I have experienced some burnout. In the last year, I went through a, a, a kind of partner buyout which involved some uh, an SBA loan as well, which I'm sure you've you've met other entrepreneurs that mm -hmm. uh, that that process is is much much larger and more difficult than than it perhaps should be, and that most people kind of anticipate, including myself. Uh, so very much, I like to. There's several things that I use to to kind of manage my own sort of burnout. I have uh, a passion for for trail running, so that that allows me to go out and exercise, to, which is a a good uh, a good cleanser for the soul in many uh, many ways. It also kind of facilitates meditation as well because uh, if you've ever run on a trail, you you, you can't you can't be thinking about something else because you'll you'll hit a branch and or a, a kind of tree root and, and trip. So uh, that is one part of it, along with a good kind of meditation practice. And again, my own sort of balance of of work life. I try and preserve at least one day a weekend where. I'm not thinking about the business. I'm spending time with my wife. We're, we're like, we'll be out in nature. We'll hike. We'll go watch music, things like that. Uh, because it is, it's, it, I mean, it's especially tough times like we're going through at the moment from an economic standpoint. There's always those, those kind of ebbs and flows. Um, but I think it's all about self-care more than anything. And what's really interesting that I've found through interviewing business owners is while burnout a lot of the times does come from something negative in life or in business, more, more burnout I think comes from when you finish something really positive, like going through a buyout. Now I'm sure there's a whole bunch of stories behind that, but at the end of the day, you know, you were probably running pretty hard and had a lot of inertia. And then all of a sudden the buyout's done, the loan is closed, you no longer have that business partner, which in all, you know, on all accounts is something to be celebrated, something to be excited about. Um, and then you, and then you burn out. It, was that your experience through it? And did you, when you got to that point of it's, it's done, did you kind of feel like you hit a wall? I, I I'm just curious because a lot of business owners feel like they, I mean, I've heard everything from raising capital to, you know, getting a big client, and then and then that's when burnout hits. Did you experience that in that uh, trajectory? Yes, I, th I, I think I did. Like, thinking back to it, uh, it's easier to look backwards, you know what I mean, when mm -hmm. you're in it at the, at the time. I, I don't think most people recognize the point that they're at. Um, yeah. But definitely for me, I think, yeah, that was that was the case. I hit this kind of, we, we the everything kind of got extended so there was oh just one one more thing one more thing one more thing we yeah. finally got everything resolved we got everything signed out and so there's that big sigh of, of relief that yeah we're over the hurdle we can move on to the next thing and then it's like oh i'm exhausted mm -hmm. <laughs> uh and it's yeah it was very much like a wall uh, that you suddenly hit and then fall off of and and it took me i don't know a couple of months i think to recognize it and then kind of get back and, and dust myself off and I guess that's what being an entrepreneur is. <laughs> it is. There's a resilience uh, that all, all entrepreneurs have after. I have a theory that I think that why so many businesses fail in the first year or two is that there's just not that resilience to keep going. You know, when you just, people just stop. And there's, if you're not cut out to be an entrepreneur, there is nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with going back to, you know, corporate America or getting a job somewhere else. But I think that that's the part that makes entrepreneurs so special is that there's this theme of just resilience and grit and determination that helps us get through burnout and also helps us succeed and do all of the things that we uh, go on to do. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. It's, it's fascinating how many peers that I interact with where that grit and re resilience is, is kind of one of their core attributes uh, across the board. Hey, this is Julie B. and you're listening to They Don't Teach This in Business School. I'm here with Ben Johnson and we were just talking about burnout. But Ben, I want to ask you, what is your favorite part about being a business owner? I think my favorite part, part about being a business owner is is creating the team, creating that, that culture that and creating a workplace where, as, as we talked about earlier, where people have that work-life balance, they 
they look forward to coming to work, they enjoy what they're doing, and they can still enjoy their, their kind of home life as well. So how, uh, creating that that's supportive of a whole team is, I think, the thing that energizes me the most. Why do you think that is? Because, you know, business owners often start businesses because they love what they're doing or they're really good at something and that's what they start their business in. And it's interesting that there's, there is this kind of flip that happens where some business owners, they really get into the culture and the, and the team. What about that do you specifically enjoy? Why do you think that that's your favorite part? Oh, that's a, that's a fascinating question, uh, uh, which I wasn't ex- expecting, but I think it's, uh, <laughs> I think it's, and I haven't really thought about it in depth. I think when it, when I reflect on it, I mean, I'm an introvert at heart. I'll, I'll, I, I share that with everyone. Um, there's nothing wrong with being an introvert. Sometimes it, it kind of drains the battery, mm-hmm. but it's, it's funny. I don't, I also believe that we're not one thing or another. Do you know what I mean? We're always on a, on a scale of everything. And when I'm in, in the room with a team and they're energized and they're sharing ideas and they have that, that kind of passion, that, that's where I kind of get that extroverted energy, do you know what I mean? Um, and pull it into me. And I think it's, uh, it, it's just at the, the, at the core of it, very rewarding to see people excited and energized about the things that I set the business up to do. And I, uh, I'm not sure if that fully answers what, what you're asking, but that's, that's, that's kind of what I feel. I think it's, there is something really special that happens when there are other people carrying the passion of the business and the vision and the mission and they're pursuing it. And because, you know, I do think there's, there is a natural ebb and flow to entrepreneurship and business ownership. And we all go through stages of being really, really passionate. And then sometimes just disengaged a little bit or just, you know, cause life happens, things happen, but it, it is really neat when your team picks up the passion from you and it's nice. It almost takes a weight off your shoulders. It's like, well, I can take a break from being the one that has all the passion because these individuals can now carry some of that. And, you know, when everybody has it, it's really fantastic too. And it can also, like you mentioned, build you up. So I think that that's, that's the gist of it is that it's really a special time when your team, um, you see that passion coming out in them as well. That's that. Yeah. That's a really good, that's a really good point in business. So Ben, speaking about your team, is there anything that you are really, really proud of them for, let's just say over the past year that you can share with us? I think that, yeah, certainly the thing I'm most proud of from them in particular is in the, in the last couple of years, if I, if I can go back a little bit mm-hmm. further. Yeah, go ahead. The, that first time that they, without any like big support from, uh, from myself or from the rest of the leadership team, took a large project through to completion uh, and a very successful project as well. It had huge impact for the customer and, and they did it like the team did that. I mean, uh, yeah. as, a, as a service business, uh, um, the business is the team and the team is the business, if you, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And uh, watching them kind of create that, that solution integrated with our customer and deliver it which was massively impactful as well. It was one of those, it, it, it improved the, what we, we call the readiness of their a, a fleet of aircraft. And that's, that's one of their kind of be all and end all. It's like making sure that the aircraft are available every time you, you want to use them. And they, not solely from the work that they did, but as a major contributor, they improved that fleet's readiness by 7%, which is like almost unheard of in the, in the industry. And so it was a huge achievement for them and they got plenty of recognition for it as well from our customer. Mm-hmm. And like, there's no better way of being proud about a team when they, they, they've gone away and done that themselves. They've m- removed all of the roadblocks themselves. And uh, yeah, it was just a joy to watch. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really special when you can sit back and, and watch your team take something and, and usually, usually do it better than, than you would have ever done it. And I think it, it, you know, it takes a special type of leader to be able to pass the, you know, pass the praise basically. Um, But it it is, if you can get to that point, it is a really nice thing to see because then you also know you have a business that can run without you. And I always say uh, one of my goals is to be, to become obsolete in some of the things that I do to no longer be needed because that's really, I think, when you're when you're hitting one level of business success is when you don't have to be there 
to make sure that things happen every single day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah so, I agree more. Yeah. so Ben, one thing I also really, I like to ask, especially somebody who's really good with team and culture, um, it's kind of on the flip side of, of the, the good stuff. What is something that you find that you have actually tried to outsource or delegate to your team that does tend to come back onto your plate that you just can't seem to get off your plate? Um, so I think, uh, I think one of the, the things that, that I'm always, I always tend to be involved in regardless. And I think that's, some of that's the team dynamics, some of that's uh, the, the kind of ebb and flow of the, the team that we've had, mm-hmm. would be some of the requirements, uh, kind of that, that customer interaction where it's, it's sitting down with the customer and uh, understanding what their requirements are and then translating it into kind of the design that they can go, and, uh, go away and build. Uh, I, I think some of that's, I, I will be honest, it's, some of that's probably me as well, it's uh, as an engineer at heart. I have that passion for problem solving, so I, I like to be involved in that. Um, but I think de- definitely recently that's one that's one of the things that I've seen start to come back a little bit. But also I've started to see some new pockets of people who are starting to pick that up. So mm. I have I have good hopes for the future that that's a, one of those things that even though I, I'm passionate about it and I like to do it, it will it won't be always on my plate. Uh, so maybe I'll be able to interfere when I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear that. It, yeah. And there's, you know, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. That's something that you hear a lot in the business ownership world. And there, everybody has a thing. My thing was bookkeeping. It took me forever to just let go of bookkeeping because um, my background is in accounting and I love doing bookkeeping. And it's very gratifying to like check things off and get things done. I, I was doing the bookkeeping way longer than I should have. And then I finally, finally outsourced it. So I was really happy that I did that. But yeah, I mean, that, everybody has the thing that they just love to do, but, <laughs> but eventually it has to come off their plate. So I've been looking, just kind of looking back, um, what is one of the mistakes that you've made in business that either, either it had a really big impact and you learned a lot from it and, or if you, if you could change it, you know, what's something that you would go back and change? Um, do you have any lessons you've learned along the way there? I think, so this, that, this like every entrepreneur, I've, I think I've learned lots of lessons. Mm-hmm. The first time we moved into a, a kind of new class A office space, it was way too small for what we needed and we outgrew it in, in six months. But I think the things like that, you know what I mean? So uh, the kind of tactical things, but I think the most impactful thing that I wish I could go back and change because you mentioned going back and change mm-hmm. would have been uh, like every entrepreneur, like every business owner, I kind of learn things as I go. Do you know what I mean, oh, I need to know how to do marketing. I guess I'll, I'll figure out that on the fly. Do you know what I mean? And so yeah. I learn just enough to be dangerous and then, and then kind of move on. And I think it would have been good for me to recognize sooner to, that I needed a bit more formal education around kind of that business ownership. Um, certainly that business management. Uh, in the end, I pivoted and I, I, that's where I got introduced. You mentioned the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small mm-hmm. Businesses program earlier. And once I went through that program, it kind of filled in a lot of those gaps. It was a, a, a tremendously powerful kind of thing for me. Uh, along with the Vistage group that I'm a, a member of, the, my peer group there is, is awesome. And there's lots of learnings we get from the speakers who, who kind of attend. So I think if I could go back and change something, I would have done all of that much sooner. Do you know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. I think it would have had much more of an impact on the business and where we are today. But um, I've done it now, and, uh, and it's it's definitely showing showing the, the impact today. You're listening to They Don't Teach This in Business School. I'm the host, Julie B., and I'm here with Ben Johnson of Freya Systems. And we were just talking about some mistakes that he would change. And what I really heard in there, Ben, was community. You would, one one was education, but the other thing, at least for me, the thing that one of the things that I got out of 10KSB was the community. And I'm just curious, I know a lot of business owners say that it's lonely at the top. And I'm wondering if, if you've ever experienced that and really how you've addressed that. And community is usually one way, but you know, if you have anything you can speak to on that, I'd love to hear it. Okay. I, I, well, I would definitely reinforce the, the community element to it. And yes, you're correct. I, I, I've spoken on a couple of panels in the past and that, that very subject has come up. And 
I've even espoused that that kind of view that it is can be lonely at the top because you can't you, you can't uh, there's that balance between being transparent for the employees but also I I own the business I own the responsibility the buck stops with me so to speak and I think the thing I found most successful in that is is multiple communities in fact like peers of, of fellow business owners just that I, I've met through networking I, I as I mentioned I use I go to a, a business group that's mm -hmm. a group of CEOs who hold each other accountable which is great as well that that adds that accountability sort of element to it but that has also spun off other other kind of communities I still meet with my my goat and Goldman Sachs growth group on a regular basis and that's all of them are bring different elements of support uh, all the way through to to my wife who I know I talk about business too often with her at times you know what I mean <laughs> that uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure she gets frustrated with it but um, all of those people I can I can be uh, honest or authentic with and, and and fully expose some of the concerns that I might have that I might not normally share with the rest of the team and I think that's a very powerful thing to do and and quite often what I get is great feedback from them and great advice if I'm looking for it as well to to help me address any of the, the kind of challenges that I'm going through at any particular sort of time so yeah definitely community and it's interesting you mentioned transparency with the team because I've talked to a lot of business owners who have kind of, myself included, who have been kind of smacked around a little bit by being too transparent with the team. And I'm really trying to practice what I call tempered transparency at this point. How do you balance transparency with your team? Because everybody thinks they want transparency when they work for, you know, a small business or any business. But then when they actually get it, sometimes the reaction they have to it is really not great for the business. So I'm just curious how you balance that, how you've learned how to balance that transparency. Uh, being candid, I'm not sure I fully have yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> I hear that. There's yeah, there's always something new to learn. I think I've tried it, especially just recently as at once once I took full ownership of the business, that was one of the things I wanted to inject into it some more. And so mm -hmm. uh, over a period of time, I've been kind of testing it, so to speak. So I'll, I'll expose a little bit more, see what the reaction is, um, see what people are anticipating. Uh, we had a bit of a pullback from one of our large customers earlier this year, which which caused definitely some some stresses on the team. And I'm very proud of how they've, they've kind of stepped into to responding to that. But that also, helped me to step forward of that a little bit more and say, okay, so this is exactly where we are. This is the, the situation and this, these are the goals that we need to achieve. And I think the, the other thing is trying to get regular feedback. And that's, that's, that's always challenging, I think, for any leader because sometimes people don't want to unduly influence their career. Do you know what I mean? And they think, mm -hmm. oh, he's the boss. Like he may, he may, he may hold this against me, but I added a, uh, a culture liaison to the to the team last year, uh, Dina, and she's she's absolutely awesome. She's very positive energy for the, the business overall, but she has helped in kind of collecting some of that that team feedback and 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 bringing it to me and vice versa. So she's she's not only helping to bring that positive spirit to the to the whole team. But give me some of that feedback, which also allows me to temper. Oh, maybe I've been a little bit too transparent here, and I need to pull back a little bit, and and continue to to sort of test the waters. It is it is one of those ever evolving things, though. I think it's it's definitely a balance, as you say. I think it's smart that you brought somebody in to help with that because. From my experience, most business owners really do want to know what their team thinks of them. But then you know a lot of the people who work for us before they worked for us, they may have worked for another small business and had a bad experience giving feedback, or they worked in a corporate America where, you know, maybe giving your manager direct feedback wasn't what you did. And you just kind of had that people often go into that self preservation mode, I think. But as a small business owner, you do want to know what your team thinks of you and how you're leading because there was nobody, you are the top, there's nobody else giving you feedback. So I think it was really smart to bring in almost like a, a bridge or translator mediator not mediator but somebody there who can you know translate between the two back and forth and it's, it's probably helped your business quite a bit yes it definitely has and and i think it's 
it's helped the team as as well. So I mean, like sometimes it's good for them to know they have a voice and that they can share some of those concerns in a in a in a really safe environment. Very much along the lines of that psychological safety, which I think is super important for any team. Absolutely. So Ben, how do you define success? Oh, that's a that's a tough question. That is, uh, it used to be, and this isn't. I, I, I'm not very materialistic as a, as a person. It used to be, oh, the revenue's ticking up. Do you know what I mean? Like that, the measure of success was the growth of the business and how it had kind of evolved. I think more and more now, it's it's seeing the successes of the team, like I mentioned earlier, in delivering those projects. So our, our, our project life cycle is, is usually quite long. Mm-hmm. So we have to celebrate the small successes every time uh, throughout it. And every time there's that little bit of celebration, it's another minor milestone achieved, and it's another measure of success in us delivering solutions to the to the customer. And I think more and more, yes, the the growth of the business is important, and yes, the those kind of financial numbers are good because, I, I say, I'm not I'm not all about I'm not in it for the money, mm-hmm. um, but it's it's that easy that's that, that hard measure. Do you know what I mean like? You, it, you can't question it because the the number's either gone up or it's gone down. It's not subjective. It's it's very clear and data driven. And I'm a data driven sort of person. But I think more and more it's evolving into those team successes and that good positive feedback that they they get from the customer on a, a regular sort of basis. Success is, I think, found in the journey. I think if you're always waiting to get to a point and having a an end point as success. What I've experienced, at least, is once I get there, I'm I'm always thinking, what's next? What's next? What's next? So you mm-hmm. you've got to find success in the journey itself, because otherwise, when you get to the end point or the goal or whatever the achievement is, you're going to find yourself asking, what's next? So I, that's what I hear in that is that you are celebrating success with your team as they're having their their wins along the way. So that's yeah, that's great. It's great. So listen, Ben, this has been just a great interview. Um, so much information. I just, yeah, the conversation around burnout and tempered transparency was fantastic, but we've got to start wrapping it up. <laughs> so I ask uh, all, all of my guests this question at the end here. If you were going to teach a class to future business owners, what is the one main thing you would want them to learn from your class? Well, that's a, that's a, that is a great question. And there's so many things like, Having been through the Goldman Sachs program, like yourself, there's so many things that I've learned now. There's so many lessons. I think, I think I would share the the thing that I'm most passionate about, though, and that's that's maybe something that a lot of your guests may not touch on, but um, certainly is important for the future. And I'm I'm I want to to share this with every business owner I know, and that's the power of their data. So. More and more, as we, we we touched on AI, AI is, is going to become part of our working lives. It's going to become part of our businesses. And there's this, and to drive AI, you need good quality data. And actually that data is, it's it, it's like the new oil. It's, it's, it's your personal gold and it's personal to your business. And I see with just, like everyday people give up their data to, to Google and Apple at a touch of a button every time their phone asks them to. I think sometimes that's become entrenched in our in our culture, so to speak. And it's like, oh, I, I, I just need to do that to, to get whatever service I, I need. Mm-hmm. But in, in the case of the data about your particular business, that's a huge part of your secret source. And that's going to be a massive driver to growth in the future. So... I think the one thing I would want to educate people in is how how to how to protect that. And first of all, they need to protect it and they need to to conserve it almost like it's more important than their their most important financial data. And then how to capitalize on it and how to use it in a very sort of successful way. Because I I think as we move forward in, into the future, with us getting into industry 4.0 it's going to it's going to be the primary driver for growth for so many businesses large and small i think it's a uh, information and data has been a currency for a long time um and i think it's with ai to your point and and there's just the 
speed and rate of technology advancing, I think data and information are, they're both becoming almost, uh, it's, it's a currency. It's so valuable. You know, we have the blockchain and Bitcoin and all of that, but I think the real, the real bet is in um, data and information because that's what everybody wants now. I mean, that's why Facebook or Meta is so successful. That's why Google has been so successful. It's not that they're great at running ads or great at building platforms, which, you know, they are, but where they make their money is on data. And that's kind of, that's mm-hmm. always been the case. So yeah, I think that is very, very important for business owners to know. Know your data, own your data, and don't give it away. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Without without a lot of thought. Um, and it will help you, you grow and be way more successful. Well, Ben, listen, I have so enjoyed this conversation. Thanks again for being on the show. Um, do you want to share where people can learn more about your business? Uh, sure thing. You, you can come and find us at uh, freyasystems.com, which is our website. And uh, or follow me on on uh, LinkedIn is is usually where I hang out from a social media standpoint, and uh, you can just find me at Ben at Freya. And that is a wrap on this episode. But please subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app so that you don't miss out on any future conversations. I'm Julie B, and they don't teach this in business school. <laughs>